Chapter 2. It was there that war found him. As a Civil War general, Ulysses Simpson Grant is a remarkable study. First, he was a most unmilitary looking officer, often dressing in a plain blue suit and a felt hat, and when he wore a uniform, it also was plain and unadorned except for his insignia of rank. He left the gold braid and epaulets to others. His manner was unpretentious and taciturn. And at age 39, of medium height and slender build, there was little in his bearing or history that suggested he might be destined for greatness, except perhaps for the steady gaze of his piercing blue eyes, which was later interpreted as a determination to succeed. In fact, he projected almost none of the possibilities that mirrored the dynamic young nation into which he was born. That he did, considering that with the span of a... I'm sorry... That he did not succeed in his early life remained a puzzle to those who knew him, considering that within the span of a decade, he rose from failed soldier, hardscrabble wood peddler, lackluster store clerk, and notorious drunkard to the most renowned military hero of the age and president of the United States. In fact, the remarkable thing about Grant was that, by all accounts, he was so unremarkable. Grant was born on April 27, 1822, in the river town of Point Pleasant, Ohio son of a tanner named Jesse Grant, and his new wife, Hannah. The family got on, got by on the father's earnings from working in nearby tanneries and were far from being considered local gentry. It took a month to get the baby named, and even then it was by drawing choices out of a hat. As a middle name, Ulysses came out on top, and thus the red-headed, blue-eyed boy became the middle namesake of the fab- fabulous Greek hero who did soldiers inside the giant wooden horse and conquered the city of Troy. As an homage to Hannah's family, Grant was given the first name Haram, after the biblical king who built the Temple of Solomon, thus making his initials H-U-G, apt enough for a boy not, not entirely appropriate as he grew old enough to endure the barbs of youthful jest. About the only thing Grant seemed interested in during the lazy and uneventful 1830s was horses with which he had reached some kind of up, subliminal understanding. By the age of six, he was using them to haul brush for his neighbors and soon was breaking and training them for a fee. And a few years later, he set up his own carriage teams to carry passengers to nearby towns. His equestrian ship was such that people remarked he was born to the saddle. At the same time, Grant was known as being shy, indifferent to school, and so absolutely revolted by the sight of blood that he was unable to stomach even a rare cooked piece of meat, a consequence of frequent exposure to his father's tanning operations. Grant's father was an anomaly for a bootstrap frontiersman and tannery operator. He was a voracious reader of everything from the classics to contemporary political tones. And as the 1830s drew to a close, he had taken to writing editorial letter- letters to local newspapers, many espousing a hatred of slavery that reflected the growing national division over that volatile issue. As Ulysses grew into his teens, his father concluded that an appointment to the United States Military Academy at West Point was the best chance for his education. First, because it was free, and second, aside from Grant's continued fascination with horses, because he was beginning to show some aptitude for mathematics. In due time, the appointment was offered and accepted, prompting one of the town folks to profess astonishment that the politician who nominated him did not appoint someone with intellect enough to do credit to the district. Grant's arrival at West Point was inauspicious at best beginning with a controversy over his name. Before he left home, Grant's cousins had engraved his initials H-U-G into his trunk, but having already endured hazing from his classmates, Grant decided to change his name, reversing the middle with the first to Ulysses Haram Grant. However, no sooner had he arrived at the Grey Castle above the Hudson River than an adjunct informed him that the only papers he had were filled out for the Ulysses Simpson Grant. Apparently, it was an error made by the appointing congressman's office, Simpson being his mother's maiden name. But the army being the army, Grant's explanations were in vain and his choices boiled down to either accepting entry as indicated on the admissions form or clearing out. Thus, the legend of U.S. Grant was born, but his fellow cadets did not yet realize this and for some reason they took to calling him Sam. Grant was mediocre as a student, but became friends with a fellow pleb, Frank Dent of Missouri a relationship that would have an important impact on his life. He was quite taken with the beauty of West Point, with its statuary and monuments to famous Americans and its fabulous views high above the Hudson. 
Once he wrote home, wistfully, as a 17-year-old boy might. I do love the place. It seems as though I could live here forever if my friends would come too. He was mostly lackadaisical in his lessons, nearly funky in French, and preferred to, preferring to sit in the library reading romantic fiction rather than buckle down to hard studies. Only in math and drawing did he excel, and those apparently came naturally to him. Little did he know that the friendships and acquaintances of his West Point days would furnish many, if not most, of the famous officers of the Civil War, including Union Generals George B. McClellan, William T. Sherman, and William Rosecrans, as well as Confederate Generals Thomas Stonewall Jackson, James Longstreet, and George Pickett. Despite his academic malaise, Grant was popular with his classmates and was often asked to settle arguments. He was anti-slavery but believed in gradual emancipation and had a little tolerance for radical abolitionists. And most everything, he seemed like just another average cadet, except for his skills at writing, and there he had no peers at West Point. One contemporary recalled that it was like a circus to see him ride. Everyone liked to tell the story of Grant's final exercise in the academy riding hall when he rode the giant sorrel yore in a jumping contest. It was visitor's day, and the stands were packed with parents of those graduating and those entering the school as well as most of, the, most of the cadet corps. In New York, before Grant got hold of him, it was known in equestrian circles as a killer horse. After various parades and expeditions, the horsemen and their mounts were drawn up into a long line in the center of the horse ring when the riding master moved the bar higher than a man's head and announced Cadet Grant. Grant bolted out of line and galloped the length of the hall in front of everyone before wheeling to the face the jump and spurring York into a measured dash down the stretch. As he neared the bar, both horse and rider sailed into the air, clearing the obstacle, as if man and beast had been welded together. The spectators were breathless. According to Observer, in Grant's record in the equestrian high jump stood at the academy for a quarter of a century. Since Grant had graduated at the middle of his class of 1843, he was denied eligibility for the Corps of Engineers and had to settle for the cavalry, artillery, or the infantry. The cavalry would not have him either, owing to no vacancy, so the young second lieutenant was stuck with the infantry, bottom of the heap so far as the army was concerned. Wearing his new dress uniform, Grant went home to Ohio on leave before reporting to his first post, only to discover that people were making fun of him because of his clothes. From that day forward, Grant's biographer, Book D. Simpson, reckoned the new brevet the second lieutenant never liked wearing a full dress uniform, and the memory of being laughed at never quite faded away. Grant's first assignment was with the 4th Infantry Regiment at Jefferson Barracks, near St. Louis, Missouri. In one way, this was especially fortuitous, because the family of Grant's oldest pals and roommate from West Point, Fred Dent, lived there. The Dents were wealthy slave owners who, in addition to their home in St. Louis proper, kept a large plantation outside of town and Dent had urged Grant to pay them a call, which he did. The young lieutenant got along well with his classmates' family, including their four sons and three daughters, the eldest of whom was Julia, who immediately held a fascination for Grant. At 19, she was not a natural beauty, but was possessed of a lively and pleasing countenance, according to one observer, and had just returned from boarding school and an out-of-town stay with friends when Grant began play, paying his calls to their family. It wasn't long before the two of them hit it off, taking the long runs over the 1,200 acres of White Haven, the name of the old Colonel Fred Dent, Julia's father, and had given the place. Grant must have been impressed by the pleasant countryside of grassy meadows, knee-deep in blue grass and clover, where cows grazed and handsome groves of trees graced the tops of hills surrounding the valley through which the sparkling, pebbly gravelous creek wound in its way. Later, Grant and old Colonel Dent would often have intense though good-natured after-dinner discussions, usually about slavery. Both of Julia's parents were impressed with Grant's poised, calm, and logical approach to what was becoming the overarching issue of the day. These were enchanting times for the handsome lieutenant. As autumn faded into winter and the spring arrived, warm and verdant, and with it, his fancy had turned to love. Then the unexpected happened, which certainly should not have been unexpected by any officer in Uncle Sam's army. Grant and the entire regiment received orders to move their headquarters down to western Louisiana, where they would constitute part of the U.S. Army of Observation. There, on the Texas border, they were to remain as a deterrent force in the ongoing disputes between Texas, which had, then, which had by then gained its independence from Mexico, 
and Mexico, which still would not admit it. Grant was on leave with his family when the sobering news reached him, and he hurried back to see Julia before the regiment pulled out. When he arrived at Jefferson Barracks, however, they had already gone, but he received a few days' extra leave to tidy up personal affairs, which, by then, including asking Julia to marry him, he did this in a sort of offhand, Julia characterized it as awkward way. He asked her to wear his West Point class ring. Since this was tantamount to an engagement agreement, Julia demurred, knowing that although she felt the same way, her father, wise in the ways of the world, had spoken to her about the vicissitudes of marrying an ill-paid and low-ranking officer in the United States Army, who at any moment might be jerked up and posted hundreds or even thousands of miles away, merely on the whim of the War Department. Nevertheless, Julia let it be known to Grant that her feelings for him were more than merely passing, and there the matter rested for the next two years, when Grant, sowing a thousand river miles away in Louisiana, until the long-predicted war with Mexico became reality, and he was given a brief leave to go to Missouri. Colonel Dett was still opposed to a marriage, but softened a bit when Grant told his perspective, his father-in-law, that once the war was over, he intended to resign from the Army and go into teaching, preferably at West Point, where he hoped his skills in mathematics would stand him in good stead. From then on, as was the custom of the times, Grant was allowed to write courting letters to Julia, though the colonel remained, though the colonel remained skeptical of his suitability. In the meantime, there was the Mexican War to be fought, and Grant received with mixed feelings the information that he had been assigned as a quartermaster of his regiment, since the job was conducted for the most part behind the fighting lines. He knew that quartermasters were vital to the operations of any large body of troops, because they were responsible for ammunition, food, transportation, quarters, clothing, pay, and other matters vital to keeping troops in the field, and besides, Grant had a fear of going into battle, which most sensible soldiers do, adding in a letter to Julia that, one way or another, it appeared inevitable so she would not worry. Quartermaster or not, Grant found his way into practically every big battle of the Mexican War. During savage hostile fighting in Monterey, the regiment had begun to have, have, sorry, the regiment began running out of ammunition, and Grant volunteered to ride back and send it forward. Few who were there got the sight of the young lieutenant clinging to the neck and one side of his horse as he galloped through the gauntlet of Mexican fire down one street and up another. In his later, in his later memoirs, he recalled that he had been going so fast that generally I was passing under the cover of the next block before the enemy fired. The American victory at Monterey did not, as Grant had hoped, end the Mexican War. It dragged on for nearly another two bloody years. Grant lost a number of friends and grew unhappy with their continuing carnage. Still, he did his duty when duty called, and, as his friend James Longstreet remembered, he could not keep him out of battle. He was everywhere on the field. During the final throws of the battle for Mexico City, Grant managed to get behind the enemy with a small cannon, which he and a squad of men hoisted to the bell tower of a church and began to fire into the rear of the Mexican army. Afterward, his commanding general sent another officer, Brevet Major John C. Pemberton, of whom we shall hear much more later, to bring him back to headquarters, where Grant, instead of being bought out, as he expected, was congratulated and made a brevet captain for his gallantry. The fall of Mexico City in September 1847 did not end the Mexican War. Instead, it lingered another five months, with the American army in occupation of the country while details of the peace were worked out. Soon, as Grant himself discussed it by the hordes of poor and starving subjects who are willing to work more than any country in the world, and yet the rich keeps down the poor with a hardness of heart that is almost incredible, he told Julia. If he made the connection between this and the southern slaves, he never said so, perhaps because of Julia's slaveholding family. Grant also found occasion for socializing with his fellow officers, most of whom would become brigade, division, corps, and army commanders on both sides of the Civil War. During this period, Grant's drinking habits were first called into question. Some early historians attempted to downplay them, but a family letter written by a superior officer who was from Grant's hometown said that his fellow Ohioan drinks too much and, but don't you say a word on that subject. His stay in the Mexico City also provided occasion for Grant to reflect yet again on his dislike of the pomp and circumstance of military life in particular, fancy uniforms. Of the two commanding generals who led the war, Winfield Scott, a hero of the War of 1812 and soon to become known as Old Fuss and Feathers, 
was characterized by Grant as wearing all the uniform prescribed or allowed by law. While Zachary Taylor, whom Grant most admired, usually dressed himself in a worn old duster and slouch hat. Grant also found time to reflect on the Mexican War as a whole, which he considered as having been trumped by President James K. Polk as Southerner. It's a cheap way of acquiring territories from Mexico in order to create new slave states. Later, in his memoirs, Grant famously expressed this by branding the conflict one of the most unjust wars ever waged by a stronger nation against a weaker one. Grant returned to St. Louis, and in August 1848, he married Julia Dent at her family home. Among the Army officers present were Longstreet, still recovering from battle wounds, and Cadmus Wilcox, destined to face Grant as a major general commanding a Confederate division. Grant was assigned to a new quartermaster post at Detroit, and Julia, with no housekeeping and cooking experience, and no slaves to help her, dutifully tried to fill the role of an army wife. In 1850, she gave birth to a son, Frederick Deck Grant, and she began dividing her time between Grant's post and St. Louis, which only added to his boredom with peacetime military life and the attendant at temptations. Whether or not that had anything to do with it, Grant soon joined the Sons of Temperance with a pledge to stop drinking. It wasn't long, however, before the 4th Infantry received orders for the Pacific Coast. The notion of Julia going with him was out of the question. With Fred only two and Julia pregnant once again, Grant set out in July 1852 with part of the regiment on a steamship bound from New York to the Isthmus of Panama. In the days before the Panama Canal and the Transcontinental Railroad, there were two practical ways to get to the American Pacific Coast. The first was the hazardous and discomforting voyage around Cape Horn at the tip of South America. The second was a much shorter, but perhaps even riskier route over land and water from the Atlantic to the Pacific, Pacific across the narrow west part of Panama, and this was the way Grant had been ordered to take several companies of soldiers, plus a number of dependents across the Isthmus. The passage was nightmarish, but from beginning to end, the meals that had been requisitioned, requisitioned by the army to carry everyone through the pestilent swamps and jungles never showed up, and Grant was forced to hire dugout boats operated by drunken knife fighters who spoke no English. Malaria and other tropical fevers broke out as well as an epidemic of cholera, so that by the end of the journey, more than a hundred soldiers, wives, and children lay dead and buried in Panama, nearly a third of those Grant had started out with. All the while, witnesses reported, Grant ministered to the sick and dying, hardly sleeping, pushing things forward as best as he could. But when he finally arrived at Panama City, he got his first dose of the quirkiness of the press when the English newspaper there blamed him for the disaster. With that behind him, Grant and the remainder of his party reached California, where he was further assigned to the remote outpost of Fort Vancouver at the mouth of the Columbia River on the Oregon-Washington border. There, Grant learned that Julia had given birth to their second child, Ulysses S. Grant Jr. It's probably a combination of boredom with the mundane duties of his job and the loneliness of missing Julia, but in any case, Grant took up drinking again. By various accounts, he either became only a consistent drinker or indulged in the sprees, but everyone seemed to agree that only a small amount of alcohol had an out-of-proportion effect on him. A single glass would cause his speech to slur, while two or three would make him stupid. On one occasion, when he was the alpha of surveying expedition for his fellow West Pointer George McClellan, Grant had one too many at the officer's mess, and McClellan apparently made it come back to haunt him when the Civil War broke out. In the meanwhile, Grant tried to supplement his meager army pay by mer- purchasing land on which he planted a crop of potatoes and chopped wood to sell to steamships. Floods wrecked the potatoes room, however, and the wood also was washed away. He tried to raise livestock and poultry, but this too was a failure, as were his attempts to collect old debts from loans he had to make to fellow officers. His letters to Julia were filled with melancholy and boredom, and his loneliness was palpable. In 1854, Grant was reassigned to Fort Humboldt, 250 miles north of San Francisco, and there he first began to think about resigning from the Army. But before that could happen, an incident allegedly occurred that would follow Grant for the rest of his career. According to various accounts, he was discovered to be drunk while on payday duty, and his commanding officer gave him the choice of either resigning from the service or facing court-martial. Some fellow officers insisted that the commander had had it in for him since his arrival at the post and that his drinking was no better or worse than anyone else's. But whatever Grant's previous frame of mind regarding the army, he made his decision. In May 1854, he wrote Julia that he was coming home. 
As the Anui of Rimo army outposts overtook him, Grant had begun to fancy his future as being that of a well-to-do Missouri farmer, and he went east to see if he could make the dream come true. He was now 33 years old, and with no savings to fall back on, he actually had to borrow money from an old West Point colleague with the imposing name of Simon Bolivar Buckner, just to get home. But Colonel Dent had given Julia 60 anchors of Whitehaven as a wedding present, and Grant convinced himself that he could farm it as a profit. He was mistaken. Even though he worked long hours in the field alongside slaves provided by Julia's family, he was finally forced into cutting wood and hauling it up to St. Louis, just as he had done as a boy. As the years went by, Grant's family grew to the two boys and two girls, and they all lived in a rude log house that he had built and aptly named Hardscrabble, a considerable come down for the former Julia Dent, once the Belle of Whitehaven. Everything seemed to go wrong for Farmer Grant. In boom years, when the land produced well, prices fell and profits vanished. Then the Panic of 57 spawned a depression, so severe that as Christmas he was forced to pawn his gold hunting case, watched to buy presents for the family. A cousin of Julia's helped Grant get a job in a real estate business in St. Louis, but as it turned out, he wasn't very good at that either. He disliked the duty of collecting rent and abhorred the idea of evicting anyone. Still, he tried to make a go for it, of it, finally trading hard trouble for a place in St. Louis. It wasn't a bad house as houses go, but with his family to feed plus four slaves that Julia had owned since childhood, now all teenagers, Grant yet again found it difficult to make ends meet. He applied for the job of county engineer, for which his West Point education had certainly qualified him, but he lost out because of part partisan politics. When the new owner of Hardscrabble defaulted on the bank loan, Grant went so strapped, was so strapped for cash that he took the disagreeable step of going to work at his father's leather goods store in Galena, Illinois, up near the Wisconsin border. Jesse Grant by now had become a prosperous businessman with leather-making enterprises in several northern states, but he had also become an unbearable blowhard, inserting himself without welcome into local politics and deriding Julia's family as that tribe of slaveholders. Nevertheless, Grant had few options, since he had just about worn out the largest of the dents, and so in the springs of 1860, he rented out the family slaves in Missouri and journeyed up the Mississippi to the little hillside town of Galena, opposite Dubuque, Iowa, to join the family business. People remember him dressed in his worn army greatcoat and a dark slouch hat walking to or from his father's shop. And while at first his spirit seemed to rise at the notion of a secure job, it did not take long for the boredom of clerking at a leather goods store to set in. Customers recalled Grant as merely another apathetic salesman, while the South seethed in the wake of Abraham Lincoln's election, and rumors of war swirled in the national air. Since he had entered West Point 20 years before, Grant's career seemed shrouded in a haze of indifference and failure, but it was there in Galena, Illinois, that war found him. The firing of Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor by the, two Confederate, by the new Confederate States of America did not surprise Grant. To those who derided the notion that war would be the inevitable outcome of the election in 1860, Grant bluntly replied, The South will fight. He had spent too much time with his wife's slaveholding family in Missouri, and among the sovereign officers, he fought alongside Mexico to believe otherwise. His personal feelings about slavery had always been that it was bad in general, but if there was that but if that if there was ever to be emancipation, it should be brought about very slowly and, somehow, of its own accord. Yet, as he grew older, Grant apparently became more ambivalent about the institution when he tactically became a slaveholder himself with the addition of Julia's bondsman to the family. In fact, Grant even acquired a slave of his own. How is uncertain, but some say is a gift. One matter over which he was fervently appalled was the prospect of secession. Although the Constitution nowhere uh, specifically forbade states from seceding from the Union, Grant, along with many northern northerners and southerners, was dismayed by its obvious implications if one section of the country seceded from the whole or would prevent other states from doing the same, whether over actual or perceived grievance against and against the central government or, for that matter, even a win. And should that be allowed to happen, then the seceding states sooner or later would likely find cause for trouble with their neighbors, which would inevitably lead to more secessions and possibly to conflicts until, over time, what had once been the United States would reap the fate of Mexico, which seemed to be in a state of eternal war. Thus would be thus would the great 
American experiment in democracy and, and pulled into a disastrous, humiliating, and irretrievable third-rate wreckage of what it might have been. At least that's how the thinking went, and was how Grant saw it. He had not, however, voted for Abraham Lincoln for precisely that reason. He was convinced that the Republicans, as the party of abolition, would bring on Southern secession and the consequent civil war that he so feared. Most Northerners have persuaded themselves that even if it came to war, it would be a brief and decisive one. Grant himself held this view until the serious fighting was well underway. In his opinion, despite the Confederacy's confiscation of huge stores of cannon rifles, ammunition, and other military equipment held in the Federal armies of the South, as well as the defection of many West Point graduates to the Southern cause, the manpower and industrial superiority of the North would quickly overwhelm the rebellion. Then, he reasoned in a letter to his father following Lincoln's election, with the Republican abolition party in power, the market for slaves would bottom out until the will never disturb the country again. As a military man and West Pointer, Grant felt honored bound to offer his services and so notified the War Department of his availability. This communication, for whatever reasons, was ignored. He next petitioned the governor of Illinois seeking a regimental colonelcy, but this also was denied on account of there being so many politicians in the state demanding those same positions. Then, he journeyed to Ohio to see his West Point colleague George McClellan, now a general of volunteers, in hopes of securing a job on his staff. Perhaps McClellan remembered the time in California when Grant got drunk while outfitting his expedition. Perhaps not, but in any case, Grant was left cooling his heels for two days outside McClellan's office before finally returning to Illinois without an interview. Just as it must have seemed to the 39-year-old Grant that the world would pass him by, he was overtaken by a stroke of fate. No sooner had he returned to Springfield, then an issue arose concerning a new regiment of Illinois volunteers who had revealed themselves as little more than a mob of chicken thieves led by a junkard. When this information was brought to the attention of the governor, Grant was appointed to take charge of these people and straighten them out, and with the rank of colonel. This he did in a firm, quiet, and persistent way, benefiting, befitting a military academy man. In less than a month, the hooligans were invited with drill, discipline, and such liberal doses of the guardhouse that they were rechristened to the 21st Regiment, Pride of Illinois, and ordered to southern Missouri, where secessionist bands were causing trouble. Thus far, Missouri was still in the Union, by the slenderest of political thread sense, as a slave state. Loyalties were decidedly mixed. Small rebel detachments were burning bridges, reconnoitring, and shooting at Union soldiers, aided and abetted by a large number of southern sympathizers. Grant's job was to suppress this behavior, and, in the days before the conflict turned into hard war, he chose to do so by offering the carrot instead of the stick, promising protection to those who would profess loyalty to the federal government. During this period, no battles were fought and engaging the Confederates was like chasing ghosts. But Grant performed so well at it that he was given command of three other misbegotten regiments and told to bring them up to snuff. Technically, this made him a brigade commander, which ordinarily carried the commensurate rank of brigadier general. Nevertheless, he was shocked to learn from the newspaper that he had actually been promoted. This was the doing of an old friend from Galena, the Republican Congressman Elihu Washburn, who would favor prominently in Grant's career from time to time. Now that Grant was a brigadier, he not only held more responsibility, but some measure of authority too, since general officers are well set off from the rest of the military hierarchy. In the space of less than two months, he had gone from being a has-been former army captain and failed armor, farmer and businessman to a general in command of several thousand infantry soldiers. The question now became what he would, would do with them. This is partly answered when he was placed in charge of the district of southeast Missouri with orders to bring to base several large Confederate forces operating in that region, as well as in nearby Kentucky, on the east side of the Mississippi. Grant had no sooner arrived at his new headquarters at Cairo, Illinois, than he began laying plans for movement to occupy Paducah, Kentucky, whose citizens were gainly gaily anticipating the arrival of Confederate General Gideon Pillow and his troops. To their dismay, however, Grant got there first, and when the initial shock wore off, nervous Paducahans were relieved to hear Grant's proclamation that I have come among you as your friend and fellow citizen, in which he pledged to respect their rights and property, which, as both parties understood, included slaves. While having occupied Paducah without bloodshed, Grant then turned to a more serious operation across the Mississippi 
or a Confederate encampment under the rebel General Sterling Price was building up forces near the little town of Belmont, Missouri, and blocking Union traffic on the river. Grant saw this as an opportunity to bring his troops into a real battle, and, with two brigades at hand, he arranged for them to be transported from Cairo on river streamers just to the north of Belmont, with the object of driving the Confederates back into Arkansas. Even then, Grant seemed to grasp that the overarching strategy in the West would focus on clearing the Mississippi, as opposed to merely capturing cities, thus restoring federal commerce from the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico, while at the same time cleaving the Confederacy in two. This corresponded roughly with the notions of both Abraham Lincoln and the aging Winfield Scott, General in Chief of the Army. Scott's so called Anaconda Plan had been had called for a naval blockade of all southern ports, including the bottling up of Confederate shipping on the Mississippi, which would deny the South its priceless cotton trade with France and England, as well as imports of foreign arms and munitions, squeezing the rebelling states into a relatively bloodless economic submission. This was derided in the press, North and South, as being unrealistic, and to some extent it was without sterner and more immediate measures, but in the end, it was the Anaconda Plan that helped bring the South to its knees, much sooner than might otherwise have happened. Lincoln saw it too. In the Eastern Theater, federal armies had been throttled by Joseph E. Johnson's rebel army at Bull Run, and in the Shenandoah Valley, but the President was slowly coming around to the notion that instead of concentrating entirely on the capture of the Confederate capital at Richmond, the Union might better con concentrate on the West. From his useful days as a flatboatman on the Mississippi, Lincoln understood the value of commerce along the Great River and its tributaries from both an economic and political perspective. This last was a, with a canny eye toward the upcoming Congress, congressional elections of 1862. As things stood, it was the North that was currently being squeezed, particularly in the northwestern states, what is now known as the Midwest which were likewise unable to use the Mississippi to ship their products to foreign and domestic markers, markets. And with the usual results, as steamboats rotting at the wharfs, crops not crops rotting in the fields, timber and manufactured goods piling up in storage sheds. But the more the president pressed for the Union armies to advance downriver, the less it seemed was achieved. It was not so much the fog of war as it was a haze of obfuscation, obstruction, and excuses. No general in the West seemed anxious to risk his reputation in battle against the Confederates, and the greatest uh, obfuscator of all was the commander of the Department of the West, John C. Fremont, the legendary Pathfinder. Fremont was Grant's boss, elevated to that position partly through his trailblazing exploits in the West and partly because of his political connections. He had married the daughter of Thomas Hart Benton, a Democratic senator for 30 years. Fremont had no formal military training, but he had published several accounts of his Western explorations that had made him a national hero. However, his experience with handling large body bodies of troops, let alone whole armies, was nil, and the result was that his department was a mess. Like a self-imposed prisoner of Zenda, Fremont inst installed himself in a palatial St. Louis mansion surrounded by a ridiculous coterie of widely dressed French and Prussian guards and received almost no one in his headquarters, including his own generals. His logistics were utterly chaotic, marked by extravagant government contracts with unscrupulous suppliers, and his chief concern seemed to be an obsession with destroying slavery wherever it existed, a policy that was precisely what Lincoln did not wish to implement for political reasons, at least not for the moment. It was in this confused setting that Grant set out to do battle at Belmont, which initiated the first serious dealings with the Union Navy which was later to play such a large role in the campaign for Vicksburg. There were plenty of river steamships tied up at docks from Cairo to St. Louis, so Grant had no trouble dragooning captains and crews to handle them. But what he now needed were federal gunboats to escort his troops 25 miles downstream and provide protection while his forces landed. All of this was arranged agreeably by the Navy, and on November 7, 1861, Grant shoved off with five infantry regiments, six artillery batteries, and two cavalry companies total about 3,100 men, accompanied by two wooden gunboats. The mission was to be in the nature of a raid, rather than an expedition of conquest and occupation. The Confederates had been using their camp at Belmont to send reinforcements across the Mississippi to the strong new fortifications they were constructing at Columbus, Kentucky, on the opposite shore. It had originally been Grant's intention to annihilate both of these positions, but Vermont had not seen fit to send enough men to do the job, so the best Grant could hope for 
was to stir in the tide of rebels crossing the river, if only temporarily, and deal with Columbus when the time came. As battles go, Belmont was by no means what Grant had wished for, though it certainly got him off to a good start. His force landed without opposition about two miles north of the Confederate encampment, a landscape of woods and cornfields, and marched toward the enemy. Though the rebels had been warned at the first sign of Grant's approach by their cohorts on the Kentucky side of the river, they were sufficiently surprised so as not to be as ready for battle as the approaching Yankees. Great clad skirmishers and sharpshooters took pot shots at the Union soldiers but withdrew steadily back toward their campgrounds, where the main force was assembling into battle formation. When it was met with a heated fire from Grant's columns of blue, the Confederates scrambled over the six-foot-tall bluffs that formed the river bank. With their backs thus to the river, Grant lamented afterward. If the rebels had been immediately pressed, he might have bagged the whole bunch of them and come away with several thousand prisoners. That was not to be. As Grant's salary described it, the moment the camp was reached, our men laid down their arms and commenced rummaging the tents to pick up trophies. Some of the higher officers were little better than the privates. They galloped along bow from one cluster of men to another and at every halt delivered a short eulogy upon the Union cause and the achievements of the command. Worse, while the fool this foolishness was going on, the Confederates were not just sitting there like cardboard dummies, but instead began working their whole force upriver, along the bank and out of sight, in an effort to get between Grant and his critical chancellorships. Worse even than that, Grant saw to his horror and coming from the opposite shore, the two rebel steamers filled with, from boiler deck to roof, with enemy reinforcements. With this unnerving development, Grant ordered his men to burn the enemy camp, then retreated back to his transport. But as soon as the fire began to blaze, the rebel artillery on the Kentucky shore, which had previously held its fire, unsure until then of who was in possession of the encampment, immediately opened up on them. As if this was not bad enough, the Confederates who had worked their way along the river bank now began to emerge between Grant and his ships. The only route of escape and the alarm sounded, surrounded was cried out among the blue-clad soldiers. Grant, trying to put the best face on, on it, later remarked, At first, some of the officers and men seemed to think that, that to be surrounded was to be placed in a hopeless position, where there was nothing to do but surrender. But when I announced that we had cut our way in and could cut our way out just as well, it seemed a new revelation. Somehow, most of his force managed to get back to the transports and haul off the safety upriver, making its escape in an almost comical fashion were it not for the casualties involved. To Grant, Belmont had accomplished at least two things. First, it had proven that his men would fight in a heated battle, and second, demonstrated to the Confederates that they could no longer operate with impunity in Missouri. Belmont was a relatively large engagement in the West for that period in the war. 485 Union soldiers had been killed, wounded, or taken prisoner, and Confederate losses were tallied at about 600. Though Grant considered Belmont a victory, he was lampooned in the press, which characterized the action as a Union retreat, wholly unnecessary and barren of results, nor the possibility of them from the beginning. Nevertheless, the new Brigadier General had taken his first major steps, what was to become a long, bloody road. After Belmont, Grant returned to his base at Cairo and pondered his next move. His strong inclination was always to attack and wrest Columbus away from the Confederates. But by then, the thoroughly unarmed Southerners had so fortified and reinforced their base that it was impossible with the troops Grant had on hand. Shortly after the Belmont fight, Fremont was fired by Lincoln for delivering a premature Emancipation Proclamation, replaced by the nervous, bug-eyed military whiz Henry Halleck, who had written several admired martial textbooks but never fought a battle. Like Fremont, Halleck was cautious, but he felt compelled to heed Lincoln's frustration edict that in the Western theater, a concerted movement southward by Union forces should begin no later than George Washington's birthday in early February. By then, Grant had under his command two of the three officers who had become his stalwarts in the campaign that would ultimately lead to the Battle of Vicksburg, but both were suspects so far as their loyalty to U.S. Grant was concerned. Colonel James B. McPherson was an energetic young West Pointer who had finished his first class who had finished first in his class and had been assigned by Halleck as Grant's chief engineering officer. But he was also to act as a spy for Halleck, on his staff he once served. The object of the spying involved rumors of Grant's drinking, which had not only come to Halleck's attention but rever reverberated all the way up to Lincoln himself from a variety of sources, many of them dubious. 
The second officer was Colonel J. A. McClernand, an Illinois congressman and political general who had no previous military experience, but he was a friend and a political ally of Lincoln's, though he was a Democrat. He was also something of a gas bag who sought to glorify himself at every opportunity and, though Grant had praised him publicly and officially for leadership and bravery at Belmont, it was McClernand who was behind at least some of the rumors that Grant was a drunkard. With McPherson applying his engineering skills and Grant leaning over his shoulder and puffing relentlessly on his pipe, the two poured through maps and scouting reports and came to an enlightening conclusion. Though Columbus was presently too strong to be taken, it might not be necessary after all. About 50 miles to the east of Columbus, near the Kentucky-Tennessee border, the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers come within 10 miles of each other to join the Ohio, which then flows into the Mississippi. The Confederates had strong fortresses on each of the two rivers, rivers near their influences, Fort Henry on the Tennessee and Fort Donelson on the Cumberland. Grant and McPherson soon had a plan formulated to capture these two bastions by an integrated force of arms, with the desired result of cracking the Confederate stronghold in two, where they, would, where they were least expecting it, right down the middle of Kentucky and Tennessee, to the Mississippi-Alabama border. On January 6, 1862, Grant took his plane to Henry Halleck in St. Louis, where both he and it were received with such little cordiality that I was cut short as if my plan was preposterous, according to his own recollection. Rivers were a main artery of travel in those days, but even so, until the invention of the steamboat, the South would have had little to fear from a northern invasion in that quarter, since the currents of both the Tennessee and Cumberland flowed north. But by the outbreak of the Civil War, the steamboat was in its heyday, with hundreds of those with hundreds of them plying rivers all over the West, and immediately upon the outbreak of hostilities, the federal government commandeered as many as it needed for troop transports and gunboats. These last were an especially formidable departure from anything yet devised in river iron warfare. Aware that the Confederacy was fortifying all strategic points along its rivers, northern strategists quickly concluded that since the rebel forts were protected by an array of large fixed cannons, they could be reduced only by the use of powerful steam warships armed with heavy artillery that would be too awkward for an army to lug over land. One of the first men to recognize this was a savvy St. Louis engineer and riverman named James B. Eads, who had made his fortune salvaging submerged wrecks with a small fleet of boats he had tailored especially for the task, including the, a diving bell named after him. Eads suggested to U.S. Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, that several river steamboats could quickly be converted into gunboats by cutting them down almost to the waterline and strengthening them with thick oak planking and arming them with big guns. While this work was being done, authorities in Washington decided that a fleet of even more powerful warships would be needed, but the novel designs suited to the particular needs of fighting on closed, shallow bodies of war. By this time, practically, all naval warships were powered by the reciprocating steam engine, usually with sailing gear as an auxiliary that was the Blue Water Navy, intended to fight on oceans and not in the treacherous shoals and mud banks of the alluvial Mississippi River bottom. Accordingly, architects on the Naval Bureau of Construction began to draw up plans for an entirely new kind of fighting vessel, the river gunboat. These were not boats in the conventional sense of the term. They were upwards of 200 feet long and more weighed as much as 500 tons, employed crews of up to 150 men, and could bring to bear a concentration of 20 large caliber cannons at over the water speeds of around 8 to 10 knots. They were self-sufficient except for the coal tenders that supplied their fuel, protected by iron armor plating 2.5 inches thick over solid oak planks from 12 to 24 inches deep, and carried main batteries of 32-pounder guns, as well as huge 42 and 64-pounder Dahlgren guns, far superior to the 12-pounder parrot guns that were the mainstay of armies in the field. These became the city-class, iron-clad fleet, named after towns along the Mississippi and its tributaries. In late 1861 and early 1862, the St. Louis, Carondelet, Louisville, and Pittsburgh were completed in St. Louis, and the Mound City, Cincinnati, and Cairo slid off the waves near Mound City, Illinois. It was one of the most remarkable feats of shipbuilding in the world, since the authorities in Washington had decreed that the vessels must be commissioned within 64 days from laying of the keel to final completion. The man selected to perform the heroic, 
Herculean task was James Eads, who would have finished on time if the government had provided him the funds. As it was, he financed the boats himself until his credit ran out, and even with that, he was only a couple of months late with the whole project. Two additional ironclads were converted from existing river craft. One of Eads' own salvage ships, Benton, a monster more than 300 feet long, and Essex, a bit smaller but no less formidable. Furthermore, the U.S. government commissioned the construction of a fleet of 38 mortar boats, each designed as a floating bomberman platform for a 13-inch mortar weighing for 17,500 pounds that could lob a 250-pound exploding shell a mile or more into Confederate cities or fortifications. Then there were the so-called Elliot Rams, conceived by a civilian engineer named Charles Elliot Jr., who persuaded Washington that the most effective way to sink an enemy ship in the narrow confines of the western rivers was to tear it into, into, tear into it with a fast steamboat, fit it with a large iron prow. Fearful that the Confederates might entertain similar ideas around the time that Grant made his attack on Belmont, the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, promptly made Elliot a colonel in the army and told him to see to the construction of nine of the ships. Soon, Elliot had converted the river streamers, Queen of the West, Lancaster, Switzerland, Monarch, Mingo, Lioness, Fulton, Horner, and Samson, and the formidable ram ships, strengthening their timbers and bulkheads, and especially their engine mounts against the inevitable shock of plowing full speeds into another ship or boat. Ellet's thinking was that his steamed rams would have no need of armaments or heavy guns, which would slow them down, and that their increased speed would provide all the protection needed to avoid fire and sink an enemy. It was a good idea, almost brilliant for the time, considering the confines of the rivers in which operations were attended. Eventually, there would be six of the Elliot family, brothers, sons, nephews, and cousins, to join in this novel experiment. Such was the Union strategy for reclaiming the Mississippi by water. A fleet of nine ironclads, three wooden gunboats, 38 motor bo mortar boats, and nine Elliot ramps, 59 ships in all, not including tenders, coal barges, transports, signal boats, and other lesser craft. The Confederacy did not have such complicated naval issues to resolve, mainly because it had no means to solve them. There was no shipbuilding facilities in the southern Mississippi River Basin, no large foundries for manufacturing iron plate or for making steamship engines, and a few large caliber cannons that were eventually mounted had to be taken from existing forts or from captured Union vessels. Still, the Confederates knew soon enough of the mammoth shipbuilding enterprises and the making up north, and it had become clear that Something must be done to counter them. Accordingly, eight large and fast river streamers were com commandeered and work was hastily begun for their conversion into fighting warships. By necessity, lack of armor and armaments dictated that these ships, like Ellis, would have to be defensive rams, although an attempt was made to give them um, protective shields by surrounding the superstructures, in particular the pilot houses and engine of, and mechanical compartments, of bales of cotton, cotton clads, or by wrapping them with thick anchor chains or coils of mooring rope. In some cases, railroad iron was used, and in a couple of instances, shipbuilders were able to scrounge up them en enough thin metal sheathing to protect the vessels against rifle fire. They became known as tin clads. To make matters more difficult, since the Confederacy had no navy to speak of, civilian riverboat captains and pilots were selected to command the boats which came to be known as the River Defense Fleet. The General Lavelle, General Price, Little Rebel, General Beauregard, General Bragg, General Sumter, General Van Dorn, and General Thompson. With no uniform specifications to follow, each captain was ordered to equip and outfit his ship as he saw fit. And so, depending on the military knowledge of each officer, these craft began to undergo profound changes from their previous occupations as passenger or freight steamers. Foremost was the installation of large iron rams attached to the boat bows. Most of these boats were smaller by a third than their Union counterparts and usually carried only one or two guns, fore and aft. But, as with Ellis' design, it was hoped that their speed up to 12 knots would make up for at least some of their disadvantages. The one matter in which the Confederates did not have to compete with the Yankees was in the organization and com composition of crews. From the start, this became a mess of both sides. Washington could not decide whether the Army or the Navy would command the gunboat operations in the West. 
what was the enormous strains of the two coast naval blockade by the Blue Water Navy. It was at first concluded that the Navy would run the show on the rivers, but that the crews would have to be enlisted from the legions of civil a civilian rivermen in the Department of the West. As it turned out, most of the rivermen did not wish to get into the shooting list, and so the Navy promised that several hundred of its trained sailors would man the gunboats, but this never materialized. In the end, the Navy sent some officers and the rest of the crews had to be made of civilians or soldiers from the Army, which led one officer to describe them as a veritable set of land lovers. In the South, the same problems arose, made worse by the inevitable shortage of manpower and sheer breadth of the southern riverboatmen, who had agreed to serve with a distinct understanding or condition that they would not be placed under the orders of naval officers. In fact, they were placed under a navy officer, but just one, Captain James E. Montgomery, late of the U.S. Navy, who had been given the rank of Commodore. Still, according to contemporary accounts, these river people were said to be unable to govern themselves and unwilling to be governed by others. In the end, there were 59 Union ships prepared to reopen upper, to reopen the upper Mississippi against eight of the Confederacy to defend it. But whether by water or by later, by land, as Grant moved his army southward, picking up momentum, the battles would be as spectacular as they were decisive.